What is going on Guardians, Dorvrich here, and in this video I'm going to be doing a solo flawless run of the Grasp of Avarice dungeon as Arkstrider Hunter. This is going to be the first video in a series where I go through every dungeon solo flawless as exclusively Arkstrider, as a follow-up to my build video which I will link in the description below. These runs are going to be with full walkthrough commentary, so if any of you are looking for a very safe and consistent strategy that you can use to solo flawless all of these dungeons, that's exactly what you're going to find here. I have made some slight modifications from the build as featured in the video to better fit the particular run that I'm doing here. First, I've leaned a little more into grenades by running the jolting grenades and longer grenades fragment alongside pulses to turn them into a more potent ad clearer and a supplemental boss DPS tool alongside the lament. The other modification I've made is that I've slotted in Lucent Blade and Supercharged, dropping powerful friends and striking light, to get my lament hitting 35% harder against the bosses. This will turn the bosses into an extremely comfortable 3 phase. Almost 2 phase levels of damage, but I don't think even if I played this optimally that I'd be able to get the damage required for a 2 phase, I'd have to change my strategy. But since this guide is about consistency instead of raw speed, the method that I'm going to show here is probably one of the safest ways you can solo flawless this dungeon. This first section is pretty basic stuff. We're just aiming to collect 50 of the Burden by Riches Engrams and offering them to the crystal. All we really do here is run in and out of the cave because fresh waves won't spawn while we're in the cave. And we can use whatever abilities we want to to kill everything since every multiple of 10 that we pick up will give us our abilities back. Keep in mind that this only works the first time you pass a specific multiple of 10. For example, if you get to 30, for the first time you get all of your abilities and your super refunded. If you then put some riches into the crystal, drop under 30, and then pick up some more and go over 30 again, you will not get everything back. The only way to reset that is to become completely clean of riches. So you'll notice that we're using an eager edge sword, and it's to do things like what I'm about to do here skipping that shrieker. It allows us to skip certain enemies, skip parts of the jumping puzzle, just make things easier and save a little bit of time while we're at it. We just have to make sure here that we punch something right away to go invisible or we will get shredded, and then just run past everything else. Easy. Be careful doing this eager edge lunge right here because if you go too far forward and clip that wall in front of you, it will instantly kill you. I'm not sure if that's physics jank, or if it's like clipping into some kill box, I have no idea, but when I was first learning to do these solo flawless runs, I accidentally hit that wall quite a few times. Here you will want to make sure you do not try to jump over the pressure plate, especially if you're on a hunter and you will have high mobility, high jump height, you're going to most likely bonk your head on the ceiling, and then you'll get spiked back down on the pressure plate and die, and end the solo flawless run. It's not the worst thing in the world if it happens that early in the run, but it's still annoying to have to restart even if you're only doing the first part of the dungeon again. A little bit clumsy with these jumps here because it's been a while since I've really done this dungeon. I actually did do a run last night, but that ended due to the spark of feedback bug slowly deleting all of my buffs and abilities one by one, so I wasn't able to finish it. I tried to finish it despite the bugs, but eventually it got to the point where I couldn't even pick up riches on the final boss, so that just made it impossible. So again, with the Shrieker, you can just skip right past it with Eager Edge, and then punch one of the ads to go invisible. Hit the switch. And jump back across. Same thing, punch one of the ads to go invisible. And on to the next room. And we're going to be ignoring all of the enemies again in this room. Between the Assassin's Cowl invisibility and the speed boost we get from being amplified, we really don't have to kill any of this stuff. We're just going to bounce back and forth, hitting the switches. The reason it's really important to keep going invisible here is not actually about getting shot to death. It's about the wizards and the darkness clouds that slow you. 
If one of those darkness clouds comes at a bad time and place, it can cause you to fall to your death while you're trying to jump around. So here this should be the final switch to open up the door out of which we will get the Scorch Cannon Vandal and his friends. So we'll just throw a grenade at them. Kill this guy. And make her way to the oven to open the door. Now since we are getting shot at, I'm going to do a thing where I charge it up to level 2 and then immediately tap it a third time and that will be enough to open it. You'll notice that I'm taking the Scorch Cannon with me. It's just a nice time-saving trick because you won't have to go to the back of the room to kill the initial Scorch Cannon Vandal to get his cannon. It also makes it a little bit safer because that ogre does hit pretty hard with his eye blast, and the less time you can spend running around the room the better. For this jump, make sure you walk slowly up to the tip of the platform before jumping. Sometimes the downward slope will get you, and you'll find yourself airborne already by the time you try to do your first jump, and then you're down a jump and you'll probably fall to your death. Here I'm going to swap onto the Lament and put on double void resistance, because most of the ranged damage in this encounter is void. Rallied, reloaded, and ready to go. So you want to immediately run over to the right side over here for safety. And you'll be able to use this sort of box right on the left here to provide some cover from the Ogre's Eye Blast and the Acolytes. You just wait down here until the door is almost ready to pop, and then go up and in. And just watch how safely we can kill all of these adds in here. It's like we're not even remotely in danger. Normally for solo flawless runs, this guy's the real test, but with this build, he's honestly free. You can bank your moats in between opening up the first room and the second room if you want to. I prefer to do it this way, because every time I run back and forth to the crystal, that's more potential time getting shot by the void damage. I also should technically be using my super here, but I do have a lot of fun watching the chain lightning go off from the pulse grenades. Right, we have 22 riches out of a total of 25 that we need, so killing this guy will give us the last two, and we are off. It's very important to not pick up any more riches than you have to, especially when you're sorting the boss. Because once you've made the boss vulnerable, Every second that you are still by the crystal, depositing the rest of your riches is lost DPS time. So as soon as he raises his arms, we grenade, we super, and we go in with Lament. But when this dungeon first came out, I lamented this boss all the time, and he was not nearly as finicky as he is now. You can see how he's teleporting, yeah, there he goes teleporting behind me. And it feels awful when he teleports right out of one of the heavy attacks, because that's the bulk of the Lament's damage. But if anything, it's a demonstration of how strong the Lament is, even under horrible conditions like that. It's extremely safe, it heals me through all the incoming damage, and it dealt almost half of the boss's health in one go. Here I'm going to pick up the Scorch Cannon from underneath the catwalk, which is safer than running up the stairs and exposing myself to the Eye Blast. I'm just going to wait halfway up these stairs until the door is almost ready to pop, and go in. Now we just rinse and repeat. We gather 25 riches, put them into the crystal, and sword the boss. Unfortunately, I can't provide a very good demonstration of proper lament usage on this guy because he likes to teleport around and completely mess up the combo. But you want to do, for optimal DPS, what I call a 2-1-2 combo. So that is, charge up the sword, two lights into a heavy, and then two uncharged light attacks, and then repeat. This is different from how you'll see most people use it, which is a 3-1-3 or a 3-1-2 combo. And the reason for that makes sense when you think about it, because it takes 9 stacks of Banshee's Will to reach the max, and each light attack gives you 3 stacks. 
but what's a little bit less known about the Lament is that the Heavy Attack will also build up its own Banshee's Whale stacks. So if you do two lights, that will get you to six stacks of Banshee's Whale, and then while you're doing the Heavy Attack, you will get to that ninth stack, and you will get the full damage bonus on the big hit, which is what really matters. There are Thralls running at us, but we can just Chain Lightning punch them out of the way, and then Grenade, Super, and get back to Sorting. Another thing that helps with the Lament on this guy is to look up. I find that it locks onto him a lot more consistently when I'm looking up into his hitbox. I guess that's because he's got so much space in between his legs that if I Lament while looking straight forward, it won't really lock onto his hitbox properly. And as you can see, the second phase, and he is almost dead already, the third phase is going to be so easy. And we have so much heavy ammo laying around too. Unfortunately, the Scorch Cannon guy did not die yet, so we do have to run up here. Although with this build, it's not like it's even that much of a risk to begin with, just look at that. This build is honestly disgusting, and I am so happy that Arx Rider is finally like this. The only part of this dungeon in which this build isn't completely busted is on the final boss when you're putting riches into his crystal, getting shot from all around the room and you can't really do much about it since they're not in punching range. But we will have a very easy way of dealing with that, which you'll see once we get there. We have 11 riches after that room, which is... Less than we'd want to have, but there are enough Acolytes standing outside that we should be able to get the rest of what we need very easily. Right, we're up to 24, so we only need to kill one thing out here. And there he is, there's an Acolyte. Okay, yeah, now this boss is as good as dead. We just have to deposit, and then honestly our super and grenade would probably be enough to kill him from here. But we're gonna sword him anyway, because sorting is fun. Here come a couple thralls, we'll just give them the punching that they deserve, listen for the sound of the boss becoming vulnerable, and go in. And goodbye. Unfortunately, I don't get any loot out of here due to that run from last night that I lost to a game-breaking bug. So for the Sparrow race, I'm going to be honest, I learned this dungeon after I'd already gotten the Always on Time Sparrow, so I never learned to do it the quote-unquote proper way. But if you do have Always on Time and you follow this route, it'll be very consistent. The other big thing is that every time your Sparrow takes moderate damage like that, you'll want to refresh it. Provided that your Sparrow doesn't actually blow up, you will not have to wait for the Sparrow cooldown. Be really careful going onto this ramp here. I actually messed up and I had to make a few more corrections than I wanted to. If you fall off the side of that ramp, it's run over. Now a lot of people will take the left cannon here, I actually prefer the right, for some reason I just can never make it through properly with the left cannon. You just have to make sure you have a good amount of sparrow health when you go into it, or you're probably going to blow up when you hit the ground. Now we're just going to jump from this cave to the fallen shield encounter. And I often say that the most difficult part of the Fallen Shield encounter is not falling asleep while you're doing it. It is so easy, and so drawn out, and pretty boring.
Here I'm going to adjust my resistances to Arc Solar and Concussive for this encounter. I promise I'm usually good at throwing grenades. And so here you'll want to just look around for where the Servitor is, and there it is on the left. So aim the cannon to the left, and go to the Servitor. You want to be careful landing from here, absolutely make sure that you jump before you hit the ground or you will probably die. Also, you can choose to either kill this Scorch Cannon Vandal or not. I usually don't. There is a very small risk of the Vandal prematurely shooting the oven to set off the cannon before you're ready. But that's why I brought the Eager Edge Swords, so that in case that happens, I can just sword swipe myself back. So here we are, just collecting a stack of 20 riches to put into the crystal to make the Servitor's Immune Shield disappear. And once the immune shield is off, we'll roll its dead body into the cannon and fire it at the shield. And repeat that three more times. Honestly, this encounter is not up to the same standard as the rest of the dungeon. And I would enjoy this dungeon a lot more if they either shortened this encounter massively or just took it out. Because even with a quote unquote normal build, this encounter is still free. Risk Runner in particular, you can just put that thing on. All the damage is arc tickle damage, so Risk Runner will just chain lightning everything. So now we'll just kill that, use the super because I'm bored, and start rolling the dead body towards the cannon. Generally, as long as you get it rolling down the slope towards any of these cannons, it will settle in the perfect spot. I guess the physics does cheat a little bit in our favor. And with these particular ovens, it only takes one tap of the Scorch Cannon to set it off. So now we're going to look around and see that the next Servitor is on our left. So we're going to aim the cannon to the left and go left two times. The Servitor actually technically spawns the moment you kill the previous one, so if you do happen to see it before, then you won't have to look after firing the cannon. Again, we're going to leave the Vandal alive because I just want to get out of this encounter as fast as possible. Fortunately, the Scorch Vandal spawned right in front of us, so we won't have to go looking for him later or have to deal with the annoying Scorch Cannon fire while we're trying to do the mechanic. Yeah, that's the other annoying thing about this encounter, the shanks don't drop any riches. And I guess it makes sense because they're robots, why would they have riches? It just makes it more annoying to actually collect 20 when the enemy spawn pool is diluted by those things. it and clean up the rest of the enemies. There are a lot of riches scattered around so I'm gonna have to pay attention and go back to the crystal if I pick any of them up. Yeah I'm not waiting for those to despawn, I'm just gonna start rolling. Oh, I'm on, out the door. Have to be a little careful here because if you push it too roughly to the side, it's going to go off the edge of the cliff. Deposit that last stack of riches that was sticking around. And fire the cannon. And nice, looks like the next one is just down here. We don't even have to take the cannon to this one, we can just jump. Do not be afraid of the ankle deep water in this encounter, and this encounter only. In the final boss, getting your socks wet does mean death, but in this one, as long as you don't fall into the deep water in the middle of the map, you're fine. If 
the really annoying thing about this part is that the riches like to fall all over the place and some of them go under the bridge. You have to go up and down to actually gather them all. There is one under me, but I'm too lazy to go and get it. If it was the last one I needed, maybe I'd get it, but we're about to get a fresh spawn out this door. There is 20, and let's go deposit. Just clean up the rest of these ads. Once you've actually popped the servitor, the ads will stop spawning, but you will still have to clean up anything that's still there. They're not going to despawn. Let's roll this to the cannon, being careful of the cliff to our right. Okay, that was a little bit close. Got a couple of riches sticking around, so we'll deposit those. And then take down the shield one more notch. All right, where is this last one? Oh nice, it's right there. We only have to take the cannon one time. Alright, Scorch Vandal's right there. Let's kill him first. Now he won't bother us anymore. And collect our 20 riches. I'm not sure why I shotgunned that shank. I guess I was just bored. But fortunately, the next encounter, which is the final boss, is not boring at all. Honestly, if you've managed to make it this far into the recording of this encounter without skipping forward, I admire your patience. Almost there, just a few more kills and we'll have 20. Unfortunately, this particular platform does not have too much of a risk of losing the servitor. But rails and other obstacles to keep it from going off the edge. Grab the Scorch Cannon. And there we go. Now the cannons are going to automatically all aim towards the center. Man, it feels so good to be done here. And of course, not getting any loot because of that bugged out run from the other night. So before we go forward, I'm just going to change my loadout the final boss, Lament, and Glaive. So I did put on the Glaive during the Ogre boss, but I didn't really make use of it because it wasn't necessary. For Captain Avarok, the final boss, there is a very important reason why I'm using the Glaive. I find that people really sleep on the Glaive, in particular the Glaive's block ability. You can take the Glaive into a Grandmaster and just tank multiple enemies in front of you with the uh, Glaive's block. It's, it's ridiculous. And in anything short of a Grandmaster, you won't even be able to tell that your health bar is moving. So this is what I'm going to do to deposit riches into the crystal while getting shot without actually having to worry about dying. So what we do here is we spawn the boss and get out of the way because he kind of hurts. 
And then we're gonna run back, and as soon as we see the mini bosses, grenade them, super them. Unfortunately, it looks like the boss ate our javelin, but we should still be able to kill the mini bosses without an issue. So first, first thing, we're gonna come over here and build up three stacks of combination blow. There's two. Unfortunately, the chain lightning got the rest, so I'm gonna to have to find another spawn to get the third stack. Alright, three stacks, and we're gonna immediately go and just one-two punch combo the sniper shank. First one missed, unfortunately. He's got a little bit of a janky hitbox. And there's the finisher. And then we're going to deal with the invisible guy in exactly the same way. We're going to get three stacks of combination blow and one-two punch combo him. Right, there's stack one, stack two, and we need to find more people. I don't see any, so we might have to get this last stack off of the Scorch Vandal. Stack three. We'll go find the invisible guy. Hold still. And one, two, punch. Oh my god, I hit the boss instead. He just goes to show how forgiving this build is. So he drops 10 riches, which I will deposit. Now it takes a total of 60 to make Captain Avarak vulnerable. And because we're sorting him, it's going to be very important to keep track of how many we've put into the crystal so that we're not stuck there depositing riches past however many we need to. So, so far we've deposited 10. Here I'm just shooting some stuff with the glaive to build up the block energy for later. Now I have combination blow stacked up, full block energy, it's time to go and get these riches. I like starting on this side because the opposite side is really annoying to pick up all the riches on. You have to jump around upper level, bottom level, sometimes they drop halfway in the water. Here they tend to drop in very clean places. So that's 10. We're going to go for as many as we can here. At least 20. And then I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get these up here, but I'm going to try. Alright, 23, that's fine, honestly. So that brings us to a total of 33. Remember, always keep track of your total amount of riches. So this will be 33. Then I'm going to hop down here and try to pick up as many of the rest as I can before they start despawning. Alright, 42, 43, nope, 42. So that's a total of 52, so we need 8 more. And this is where the Glaive Shield starts to come in handy. Now it is possible to get all 60 at once and deposit them in one go, but that is a little bit more risky, because it forces you to stay on the crystal taking fire for an extended period of time. Since this is a solo flawless run, I'm going to take consistency and safety over more potential speed. So for that reason I'm doing 10, then 40-ish, then another 10. Unfortunately we do have to find another Scorch Vandal and kill him because the Scorch Cannon did despawn. I'm just going to listen for him. And it looks like he didn't even have to. Alright, we only need to pop one oven here. So I'll just go for the easiest, safest one, which is this side of the map. And there's the rest that we need. We have two extras, but two extras is not going to be a problem. Pulling up the sword here to go into third person so we can better see where the boss is shooting us from. There he is. Unfortunately, I whiffed my initial hit of my pulse grenade because he took a moment to become vulnerable, but it's not going to cause any problems. 
Now since this guy is not all janky like the ogre is, I can actually properly demonstrate the 2-1-2 combo. And unfortunately that heavy attack decided to go through him. Alright, as soon as you hear that sound, damage is over. Get out of there. Because the mini bosses will ruin your day. So we're going to do the same thing as before, going to get three stacks of Combination Blow. That's stack number three, and Scorch Vandal dead. So now that I have three stacks, time to go and one-two punch combo the Strength. Here he goes. Unfortunately, Combination Blow ran out, so I'm going to have to get another stack of three here. And then one two punch combo, Invisible Guy. Alright, that's ten riches, so I'm going to put those back in there. Now we're going to gather another 40. Yeah, I was a little bit slow picking up that first set of 10, so I don't think I'll be able to gather the riches from the third platform. I'll probably just stick with the 20 for here. And there's the last 5 to make 40, plus the previous 10 for a total of 50. So after this, to start DPS, I only need to deposit one set of 10, which will happen pretty quickly. Again, I'm doing this so that I don't find myself caught at low health, running at the boss with a sword, and get killed or stomped on the way there. Again, we're going to listen for the Scorch Vandal. Oh, he is just not shooting at us today. There's our last 10. We will very carefully put them into the crystal and then do another DPS phase. Right, he's vulnerable, so grenade, super, and then go in. One, two, one, one, two. One, two, one, one, two. Here's what I mean by that two, one, two combo. If you pay attention to the Banshee's Whale stacks on the left, you will see that it is making it up to 9 by the time I finish the heavy attack. Alright, damage is over. Get out so that the mini bosses don't kill me. Three stacks. Time to kill a sniper shank. Oh, it is beautiful when I don't actually miss the hitbox.
And my combination blow ran out, so I'm gonna have to restack before I kill the other mini boss the rest of the way. Come on, I need another spawn of fallen guys. Oh, there they are. There's our initial 10. Fortunately, we get a very long invis from killing a mini boss, so it holds us through that entire deposit. Now we'll just get some energy in this glaive for the shield and go start the final DPS phase. Oh wow, I ran right past that first group. There's no way I'm getting to the third area. It's fine. It's still two Scorch Cannon shots either way. I just like being efficient. I'm gonna jump back up here because I feel a lot safer up here than down at the bottom while charging up the oven. Clear that last guy out with a Scorch Cannon shot. And our Glaive Shield will protect us. Look at that, we're taking zero damage and we're just tanking the boss right to the face. Alright, this is going to be the last oven of the dungeon. I don't care about those guys, I have 100 resilience, arc resistance, and resistance while surrounded. Alright, and listen for the damage start sound. There it is. Grenade. Super. Destroy. And there it is, that was a solo flawless run of the Grasp of Avarice dungeon as Arc Strider Hunter. You can find a full video breakdown of the build in the description below, as well as a dim link to the exact configuration that I used for this run. Drop a like if you found this video helpful or entertaining, and if you want to see more Destiny 2 content including endgame build videos, consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one, Guardians.